following Jack Daniel is something no one really wants to do, is it? Pretty pleased about that. Hey, everyone. How Ooh, welcome last time. Hope you're all having fun enjoying the conference. I'm here to talk about security with a word missing, because uh, the projector is 4 by 3 and no one expects that in 2015. <laughs> Quality start. Another great start is uh, thanks, Pete Cheswick, for giving my damn talk during the keynote. <laughs> But it's worth it just to get a giant picture of your face on the screen. I hate you already. Um, they're just zooming in and watching you. It's like uh, the bad guy from Ghostbusters 2 who just follows you around the room. Who's this clown? I'm quite obviously in infrastructure. Well, well, I'm quite obviously from Etsy. I work in infrastructure security. I do that defense stuff that doesn't get cool headlines, but kind of is important if you like keeping your credit card numbers. Uh, I used to be an operations engineer at Puppet Labs, so I feel okay talking about how to make terrible infrastructure. Um, I own a lot of black t-shirts, so obviously I've gone to some security conferences. Um, and to prove I can do a security once, I had a shit ton of accounts in my Unix, uh, my high school Unix system, um, which obviously means I'm OG and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to talk about a bunch of things that uh, make me sad, a bunch of ways I find to fix them and cope with them, uh, other than just Pete stealing all my damn slides. Uh, and then there'll be far too many summaries, and then we go and ride on a mechanical bull. What? Uh, I'm foreign. I don't understand any of that, frankly. Mechanics or bulls, both of them. Um, so, uh, there's a lot of echo on this. Is it? like? Does it sound like a Sonic Youth album to anyone else? <laughs> you, I'm English, you don't want me singing. Probably more, more than you want me dancing. Move the mic down, that doesn't get it further from the speakers, Pete. It might have worked in your talk. All right, whatever. Um, so, so security. Uh, security is pretty important to us all. As I think everyone has talked about, um, there. Does that help? Um, we're trying to bridge that gap between developers, operations, uh, QA people, uh, farmers you employ in your organization, pretty much everyone, because uh, doing security in silos has worked really badly for us. Um, yeah, that's rad. Cool. You can all still hear me. I mean, you're smiling, so probably not. Um, and what do we mean by unicorns? Um, you've got people like Google. Some of you may have heard of them. Facebook. They're all quite big companies. Netflix. Um, it turns out not every company can be a billion dollar company uh, with a security team of hundreds of people. Uh, it turns out that's also okay. Uh, so my talk is like, say you're not Google, how would you do some security things? And that's what I mean by non-unicorns, because not everyone is, is, is a unicorn, despite my best wish and, and Mr. Cheslock's best wish. But the problem with security is hard, like, like really hard. Obviously, we have the hardest job in the industry. That's why we're all here and we go to so many conferences to really iterate the security is the hardest thing there is. Like finance is easy and like software development's easy, blah, blah, blah. Um, security is like the hardest thing. There's nothing harder. Um, and like, here's a bunch of examples. There was the really cool, a few years ago, Pinky Pwn, finding a bunch of really tiny bugs in Chrome, like, able to overwrite a bit of graphics, memory, um, tiny info leak here, and chain them all together to get a full sandbox escape. Loads of bugs you just wouldn't expect um, would actually do anything, and it just breaks the entire security model of Chrome. Really cool. Uh, Igor Hamakov, apologies, Igor, um, five small bugs in GitHub that went from, I can do this one bug, like this XSS, or this overwriting a gist, to full control of a private repository. And now he has a company that basically breaks OAuth for a living. Uh, the Google security team were playing with a chat application written in Node.js, yay. Um, and they found an XSS in it that within an hour they'd managed to turn into remote code execution because Node.js running as an application means you can run like system, like that's a good idea. Um, and you may have heard of a small company called Target who had some credentials that were on their HVAC system that may have cost like $160 million. Uh, MBD, whatever. So security is the hardest thing there is. Nothing harder than security. It's just that like building th things that aren't security are really hard as well. Like I would have no clue how to build GitHub from the ground up. Some days I struggle to push to GitHub. 
Uh, and if it says merge conflict, I'm like, cool, I'll do something else, anything. I'll like do my taxes, call a relative, whatever. Like, I'm not doing that. Um, the idea of trying to build Chrome, uh, like, how would you even, how would you make a GUI? I don't even, like, shell scripts don't prepare me for this kind of thing. Other stuff is hard. So, to the security people in the room, a sense of perspective on, like, our, our stuff's obviously the hardest. Like, you have to learn assembler, you don't. Uh, you have to understand, like, memory, allocation tables, processes, all this other stuff. Yeah, but, like, building software is hard. Uh, being on a finance team is hard. Being in HR is actually hard. And having a sense of perspective, even humility, which I know is a bad word in our industry, because it doesn't get headlines or massive payouts or cool things like that. Um, but it turns out, like, security people aren't particularly good at writing software either. Um, like, Snort has had 10 CVEs. This slide's out of date, because I guarantee you Wireshark has had more CVEs since I made the slide. Because uh, it turns out writing protocol parses for every protocol ever made in C is a terrible idea. Um, because, uh, as Nick said, writing C is really easy and everyone should do it. Um, <laughs> that, I, I got your talk right, right? That's what you're saying? <sighs> I wrote the wrong notes. Uh, Bit9, thanks for sponsoring. Um, they got hacked a couple of years ago. <laughs> Sorry, it's just true. Um, and then, like, bad things happen. Uh, a bunch of people have been spending a bunch of time just destroying antivirus um, for fun, probably not for profit, uh, like Tavis from Project Zero and some people down in South America, where it's actually to the point where they're saying it's more dangerous to run AV because of the increased attack surface than to not run AV. Because, like, viruses really, no, just don't copy that floppy and you're fine. Um, OAV, so easy to beat up on. And the best one, the one we all enjoy, FireEye caught running um, Apache PHP as root, which is actually hard to do because by default, on no operating system in the world does it run as root. You have to actively go and change Apache to do that. Um, so well done, FireEye. Leading the way there. Um, so, so who should you trust? Should you trust no one? As anyone who owns a lot of black t-shirts and goes to conferences will say, obviously trusting no one is the obvious correct assumption. Um, Mad OPSEC bro, et cetera. Um, but that like, isn't good if you work in a company and want to get paid and have friends and be invited to parties. Uh, if you don't trust anyone in your company, you have a terrible company and your company will probably not do very well. So the other option is you trust everyone. And if you do, I have some emails from Nigeria I would love to forward you. Um, nothing bad has ever happened from trusting everyone. Um, just look at DNS. Um, should you trust security vendors? Apologies if there's any security vendors sitting in the second row, Pete, you slide thief. Um, <laughs> if you have infinite money and no attackers, I suggest trusting security vendors. They would love to help you with one of those problems. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Other configurations may be available. Uh, so I recommend trusting attackers. Uh, you kind of know where you stand with those. And if you've used the internet, and I'm led to believe many of you have, then your website is probably already getting attacked and, and probed and prodded, blah, blah, blah. Um, so a while ago, this thing happened called bug bounties. You've probably all heard of them. If you haven't, it's where you uh, pay some random people around the world to uh, break your website and then tell you about it, which is, is not a, a, great mo um, a terrible model. There's two main companies. There are others, but there's two main companies, uh, BugCrowd and HackerOne. Good, my slides are still fitting. Um, like the first step in getting a bug bounty program is probably not actually to have one, because you should probably work out what you're doing with it first. Um, preparing a lot, so many of them will let you do things like have a smaller group of people, only have part of your website in scope. Regardless of how much you say this part of your website is or isn't in scope, people will still tell you about parts of your website that are not in scope. Um, which is better than the pen test model, where you go, like, this isn't in scope, because we made all the hackers pinky sweat and never in that thing. Um, which was always a model that confused me. I've never, I've never met an attacker who's gone, that's not in scope. There's no way I'm stealing those credit card numbers. Uh, that, would be, it, that would be rude of me. And, and just as a gentleman. Um, there aren't enough gentleman hackers. That's, that's definitely a problem. 
the internet would be a much nicer place. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to hack in a bow tie. Um, focus. Um, I haven't slept. <laughs> I have chronic insomnia, and this is a mess. So just bear with me and throw coffee at me. Um, we launched our bug bounty program in 2012, which is quite a while ago now because I'm getting older. Um, and we found the first few weeks were pretty much the standard, this is fine, everything's fine, everything's on fire. And we've been building up to, we have like a 12 person security team at Etsy, um, which regrettably does include me, so arguably less than, well less than 12. Um, and we had the first two weeks where it was all hands on deck going like, there's another XSS, there's another thing. And even though we thought we'd done a pretty decent job, um, I don't know, where does Signal Science get all their security people from? Um, yeah. Um, we thought we'd done a good job getting it. There was still a lot of reasonably low-hanging fruit that we somehow hadn't found. And that's like the good thing about bug bounty programs. They will find things that you don't expect um, and you could never think of yourselves, no matter how many smart people you have in a room. Um, but the thing, the most important thing we found with bug bounty program is be ready with bees. Um, so one day, uh, someone on our security team who deals with most of the bug bounties, uh, because we send t-shirts to everyone who submits a valid bug bounty, we're like, we have their address. You can get frozen bees in a box. And because they're frozen, they're asleep. And if you mail them to someone, they eventually wake up. And bees don't like being in the mail. <laughs> so when they open it expecting a t-shirt, Lots of angry bees come out. <laughs> now, <laughs> our, lawyers would, <laughs> our lawyers would probably very much like me to stress we've never done this and have no intention of doing this. We would love to do this. Um, <laughs> and anyone who's run a bug bounty program will agree they would love to do this. But we aren't going to do that because we're Etsy and we like hugging people. So bug bounty programs, as wonderful as they are, they very much deal with your external websites. I haven't yet managed to find someone who's willing to go, um, yeah, we're just going to expose our internal network to all of the world and then run a bug bounty program on that. I can't see that going wrong. Um, so like, there is the inside of your um, organization which isn't yet suited for bug bounties. And that's where traditional pen tests, red team engagements, um, what's it called, attack-driven defense, blah, blah, blah things renamed still work. Um, but that's getting harder based on the slide that doesn't fit because of the projector. <sighs> called the armadillo security model. This is the architecture that we all built, those of us who are old enough, in like the 80s, not me really, in the 80s, barely walk, um, 90s and early 2000s where you have your, um, I have a slide, your crisp external firewall uh, blocking people with hats, and then you have your, <laughs> who let's be clear are the main aggressors on the internet, those hat wearers, uh, or keynote speakers as they're called at last Um <laughs> And then inside your network, on the, in, in the inside of uh, that firewall made of bricks, you have two, possibly more servers, uh, which have full trust between them. It's the soft gooey inside of the armadillo compared to the crunchy outside of the armadillo. That's where the armadillo security model gets its name from. Um, but like 10 years ago, this little company in Seattle ruined it for everyone by making this thing happen. Um, so now rather than having your lovely armadillo security model, you have your, I have something over here in AWS, I have something over here in uh, Google Compute, I have all my authentication in an authentication provider, shocker, that's there. You have all your code in GitHub and Pastebin. Um, so, 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 which makes it very hard to define where those perimeters are. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about GitHub. Um, and the fun you can have, and if you're an attacker, you can have the same fun, you just have to put one over it and divide it by itself. So GitHub's a great place where you can store your code. Many organizations do that. Um, it's all part of this sharing and social stuff. Trouble is, uh, and I hope you can see that in this awful four by three projector, um, like some people have put their RSA private keys in GitHub, which is probably a bit more trusting than you want to be, um, unless you live on a commune. 
Um, and also over here, use my laser pointer. That's the GitHub authentication token, which is just a token that's basically the same as a username and a password to get you into GitHub. And with that, you can have full control over that repository. So you're using GitHub to put your authentication to GitHub in GitHub, and now everyone can access your GitHub. This is not a perfect model. Um, but like, this would never happen in real life other than these examples. I got using the elite hacker tool of Google, which I recommend you look into. Um, it's like showdown for web pages. <laughs> Mind blowing. Um, but this doesn't happen in real life, does it? No one would ever do anything like that. Except, you know, like D-Link put their um, Windows signing key on, which if you're a malware author, that was Christmas. Like a bunch of Christmases rolled into one. Because now you have to rely on the Windows key revocation system and system updates to stop your funny cats.exe from ever getting to the intended payload. Um, so as the generally useful advice goes, don't be D-Link. Uh, but in this case, especially don't be D-Link. Um, because then you'll have your signing keys there. So at Etsy, uh, we've accidentally had kind of, um, come on brain, you've had some sleep once. Um, like an initiation ritual of everyone who starts in the infrastructure team has written something to trawl through GitHub looking for keys and credentials. And it ends up looking something like this, which you can vaguely see as uh, using the technical programming language of some shitty bash. Um, and it just like goes through all the revisions of all the things. This one's looking for dot .files, and dot .files are the best thing. Like, if you want to know how cool someone's Vim setup is, and all their passwords and um, SSH keys, dot .files are Christmas. If you work in defensive security, dot .files are one of the worst things to ever happen because I would rather have a terrible shell prompt, but not all my like, credentials on the internet. It's a trade-off. Um, you, can, you can either make something like this. We've written two in Python and one in Terrible Bash, which seems like a waste of time. Uh, and then some kind soul over at SoundCloud wrote this thing called GitRob, uh, which is a web-based Ruby on Rails, hold your laughter, um, Postgres back way where it slurps up all the Git repositories you send at it, uh, and then you define a bunch of strings and regexes, and it looks through it, trying to find things you've defined, and then alerts you based on that. Um, if you're an attacker, you can use the thing for the same purposes uh, and become victorious that way. But if you're not using that in your organization, then go use that to find all those shared RSA keys, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, these slides will be up, Nick. Um, you don't have to take photos, and they're all links because I know how to use. You, you got it? Good. OK, can we continue? Yeah. I didn't do this in yours, did I? No, fine, fine, whatever. <laughs> now, because Pete's a jerk, I'm going to talk about Audit D. I hate Audit D. Audit D is part of the Linux kernel, and it's um, an auditing framework, very clever at naming. Um, it ties into a bunch of places. You can tie in system calls. So what we actually use it for is the exact VE system call so that we can do command execution tracking uh, on all of our Linux hosts. And Audit D is like the best way of getting this kind of thing for your infrastructure. Like patching bash is a terrible idea because you'll have to upgrade bash when they write a 10 or 15 year old vulnerability in it and you have to update it all. Or like trying to do it on the TTYs is also not a good idea. This is in the kernel. There's it's much harder to get around unless you can like have kernel exploits, zoms on, et cetera. But the, the trouble with Audit D is it's also the worst way to get information into a log file. <coughs> For some reason, the oh, are there any more Red Hat developers in the room? We ran them out. Have we? Good. Is there a strict no Red Hat employees at any security conference? Um, <laughs> or in life. Um, they thought like having multiple line output was a really good idea. Um, and Mark Elzey, uh, um, who again, Mr. Cheslock is very familiar with, uh, due to being a kernel developer, the soft, caring, kind, loving people of the Linux world um, has quite strong opinions on Audit D. And despite being at Etsy, the place of unicorns, I'm very inclined to agree with him because it's seriously 
so awful. Like, why on earth would you have multi-line logs in this day and age? Like, haven't we learned this before from a certain person or company? Like, if anyone's ever had, used Tomcat and you're like, why is the log randomly indented with spaces? Like, what, how is a computer meant to read that? Well, it's like Python, but humans can read Python. And humans can't read Java stack traces, nor should they. Um, and like computers can't read Python stack, uh, no, not Python stack, Java stack traces. It's all awful. But there are some ways of coping with um, uh, the horrors of Audit D. Um, I'm not going to say go and buy threat stack, because I'm now no longer talking to Pete. Um, but that is, if you have money, not infinite money, but some money, and use AWS, then threats, that's the best thing. Um, Elk, if you're using Elk, which is like Splunk but free, um, it's not. Um, then that has a way of doing multi-line log filtering, which is how everyone has coped with Java. Uh, if you're using Splunk, you don't need me to tell you how to do things. You have a sea of consultants earning infinite money. Um, so you can just go like go and do your Splunk things, infinite paid people with your infinite paid product. Um, the good people over at Mozilla have released Golang code to parse this, blah, blah, blah. There are ways of coping. It's just awful. Red Hat should fix it. Story of my life. Um, but the good thing once you have this data in like Elasticsearch or Splunk or um, a collection of shoeboxes, however you decide to store this data is you can then use like Elastalert if you're using Elk. And then you can learn on netcat minus e bin sh, which, uh, as anyone who owns a lot of black t-shirts will tell you, is a reverse shell with netcat. Um, and that should never really be run in your infrastructure unless you employ operations people who like finding new and interesting ways to make your alerting light up for doing things like, I definitely need my IRC alerts appearing on my desktop. I will definitely proxy those over an SSH tunnel and SOCAT. That seems the most obvious way of doing that. You like. So you've definitely been owned, and you're like, no, I'm just getting IRC alerts. Like, this is my surprised face. Awesome. Um, but with that, you can also, oh God, I hate you, Pete. You can also do great things, like you can spot when people start doing this kind of nonsense, um, which is where you download random things uh, off the internet using curl or wget, and then you pipe them straight into bash, or more often, sudo bash or sudo sh. Like, that's a good idea. Um, if you trust this, and clearly Pete does, you should definitely run this on a Mac. Anyone has a Mac? Right? It says legit. Like, <laughs> what do you people want from me? That's better than GPG. Like, genuinely, probably is better than GPG. It's at least more user friendly than GPG. Um, and the, the argument put forward by people is that they check them. Um, and I'm going to give a few examples that are fun where that really doesn't matter whether you check them or not because uh, I'm stuck up here presenting, and you have to endure it. If you've heard of any of the malvertising stuff recently, they, these are stealing some of their cool tricks. Um, this one's like, if the, the HTTP user agent contains curl, then send back the payload, and if it's anything else, print something that looks like install code. So if you open it in Chrome, it looks totally fine. And then you're like, cool, I'll trust that. I'll pipe that into SH, and then, oh, reverse shell. Boom, you get the... Get the power up, you win the game. Um, so that's one way that uh, you can do that. Another way is, um, that is used a lot in malvertising campaigns is, um, like, if I've ever talked to this IP address before, then um, print something that looks legitimate. If I haven't, then send the payload. And this works in a number of ways in that you will blindly trust it. The thing will get installed. Then you go, huh, that's funny. I wonder what that did. And then you look at it again and go, oh, it looks fine. I just don't know what I'm doing. I'll type it again. Or if you go, something weird happened on my machine. Would you check this person sitting next to me who naps out via the same IP address? They look at it and go, looks fine to me. I don't know what's gone wrong with your machine. Um, but all, so those are just two fun examples written in bad Sinatra of how you can own people with curl. Uh, this is what it looks like in Terminal, uh, if any of you Terminal, which is the default on Macs. Um, and because we're all in Austin and hipsters, we're all running Macs. Um, and that looks fine, right? You'd totally run that. That looks utterly fine. Uh, this is what it looks like in iTerm. 
Uh, and that's just using ASCII escape codes to change the color of the text. Um, and that's why the, there's a space before the echo because it's after the comment. So the echo trust is great never gets run in this payload, but it looks like it gets run in the previous one. Uh, and if you curl that to a file and then cat it, you get exactly the same thing. So even the downloading it and then running it, uh, and then checking it and then running it, you're like, but it's fine. It says here it's fine. Uh, and even if you don't, can anyone tell me what that does? I, it's not a fault bump. It's Mac specific. This is my mad zero day payload. Um, yeah, I've written a sophisticated shell. But that's what I do for fun. Uh, it runs PM set sleep, which basically turns puts your Mac to sleep. You can tell that. Yeah, whatever. Um, and this, the, this is no worse than packages. Um, this is the thing I hear thrown around a lot. Um, and parts of the packaging model are broken. Like a lot of the GPG signing is not perfect. Um, but there are things you can do. Um, but you can't actually verify them. And even if you aren't verifying um, that GPG is amazing and you have a full chain of trust, you are at least verifying that what you have is the same as what someone else has. And there's some herd immunity in there, um, unless you're an anti-vaxxer, in which case you're, you're, you're kind of out of luck there with GPG. Um, but also, the good thing with packages is, yes, you can do this. You can put in malicious payloads in packages, or MongoDB, as it's called. Um, but, <laughs> but like with this, you have an artifact. You have a thing on disk. If you install something from a network, it's ephemeral. It's one time. With this, you can do incident response. You can give this to your DFIR team, and they will go, oh, yeah, this is what happened. This is what installed. If you just pull something off the internet one time, that goes away. And the same of um, Mr. Cheslock's point of if you git clone something, is that um, better or worse than curl? I would say it's better because you have that on disk. And if you have it on disk, you can actually inspect it after the fact. You could write a very cool um, like thing that then modifies the stuff on disk. Uh, but then you have to get around git in that case. And it's hashing of things. So it gets complicated. And you can compare that again to upstream. So having an artifact on disk is, to me, more important than blindly trusting the network. Um, and like, these don't exist. There is no uh, GPG verify option to SH that at least I've discovered. Um, and that's kind of good, because imagine mixing SH with GPG. That would be a bad day. Um, and then there's the, the other thought, which I think Pete covered again, that like, I trust HTTPS. Um, and, but search costs like $6. If owning your company as an attacker, I can't make $6 out of it, I should probably quit being an attacker. Um, and like take up the ukulele, I could probably get more than $6 from that. Uh, and also, if owning your company or infrastructure is not worth $6, you're basically a failed company. Um, and soon Let's, Let's Encrypt will make this free, so it will be free to own your company. Like, I don't want to put all my hope in zero dollars. That seems a bit of a bold move. Um, and as anyone who's ever used Linux before will tell you, no one knows where the certs live. Everyone runs curl with minus K because certs just never work on Linux. Or Mac, because Homebrew changed it and then they moved it out of curl and now it's no longer open SSL, it's secure transport and you have to export them from keychain and curl minus K makes all this pain go away. But it doesn't. So basically, you're doing that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, get a quicker camera. So there's, there's a number of opinions on what to do. Um, certainly, some people have had an entire blog post going, just stop caring. We're mostly security people, so I'm not sure stop caring is a thing we do. Drink heavily might be a thing we do and ride mechanical balls. No one has explained this to me. But because I'm a fool, I will now do a live demo. Yep. No, I won't. Terminal. All right. That seems fine, right? I can run that by that. Echoes test. Cool. Good, curl is actually a file. Don't, don't peer behind the curtain. Um, 
should I run, well, should I pipe that to pseudo sha? What do we reckon? Those who know the arguments of RM. Does that look like a, a thing I want to run? <laughs> I'm not going to do that first. <laughs> first, I'm going to run this installer with curl pipe to sudo sh. Yes, yes, I realize the irony in this. I am Sideshow Bob appearing on television saying, stop watching television. <laughs> but now I feel relatively confident in not finding my command history. There we go. Doing it, I'm doing it. Um, so that's replaced curl uh, with a shell script that checks if the uh, standard out of curl is a pipe. And if it is, it runs ps to see if there's sudo sh running on the same terminal. Uh, and if it does, it just echoes out, like, don't do this, please. So I can still run that, and it will still go like, that will work. But if I do sudo sh, it's like, nope, stop doing that. And you can use this to make it the very last time you do anything with curl pipe to sudo sh. And I suggest you go do that everywhere and then never have to do it again. I tried to make a package, but it was too hard, so I didn't bother. <laughs> <laughs> My demo worked. All right. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really great contrast. Uh, so it's 2015. If anyone was in the Docker security talk earlier or has developers in their company who are under 30, you'll know that Docker is a thing that everyone has to have a one of or many of now. Um, and it's the new hotness. It's changed everything. It's never been done before. Uh, it's revolutionizing the world or revolting the world, depending on your perspective. Um, but like, stuff like Docker has never been done before. Like, this, oh, wait, no, Chiroot exists, doesn't it? Hasn't that existed a while? Like, does anyone remember using Chiroot? So why did we stop using Chiroot? Um, it's because remembering the flags to compile bind with statically just was too damn hard. Um, so we all kind of gave up on that. So it's understandable that Docker now has taken that and done all the magic it has and is blowing the world away because nothing else exists. Wait, no, previously jails have existed for like 10 plus years. And they're like way more capable. So why didn't they work? And my, my fear with that is because FreeBSD is only used by like me, some people in Germany, and Yahoo once, and that's it. Which apparently isn't enough to get VC funding in San Francisco. Um, but all right, all right. So FreeBSD jails didn't work because of bad advertising, and whatever. But so it's straight to Docker. Wait, no, Solaris zones have existed for like what 20 years, maybe. And I think that hasn't worked because trying to get a developer excited about Solaris, yeah, it's a, a little challenging, let's say. Trying to get anyone excited about Solaris, is it, other than an attacker. I imagine an attacker is like, Solaris, I'll be home soon. Um, <laughs> gonna take the rest of the week off. This one should be a doddle. Um, why is Tish loaded? Um, <coughs> But, <laughs> all right, so let's ignore Solaris. This has obviously never been done because no one's ever used Solaris. So, but, but like AIX even has this. But no one I've knows how to use WPARS because it's on AIX and you can't even install SSH or make, which would probably mean your developers won't pick it up very quickly. Explaining to your developer that it doesn't have bash. What do you mean it doesn't have bash? Yeah. I'll just compile it. There's no compilers. What do you mean there's no compilers? You're new here, aren't you? <laughs> so Docker, blah, 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 whatever. Um, but the question that people keep throwing around, um, something was thrown around in that talk is, is Docker secure? Um, and a while ago, there was this great thing that came out, please fit. It fits. It's kind of weirdly formatted, but it fits. Um, the 30% of images in Docker Hub contain high priority security vulnerabilities. That sounds like a lot. Um, but if anyone works in an, organiza an organization that has a bunch of infrastructure, that number doesn't sound impossible, right? Like, if anyone has, NT4 might be a kill, uh, overkill, but like a Windows Server 2000 and change machine, 
going. Yes. Like if you have a, a red hat, like five, maybe six, probably that number isn't, isn't, that in, isn't that out there. Like this is also the same headline. Um, yeah, turns out things that are static and baked one point in time get security vulnerabilities in them. Um, that's not, I don't see how that's quite the shocking news of this build, at, build as. But the, the, the other thing is like, this is really where everyone gets their Windows media from. It's not MSDN, is it? And like, if you can't trust the very clean, no virus or Trojan. <laughs> like, you think Kel Bash is bad, like that's better than GPG. That one is, it's totally legit. Yeah, it's better than my domain. It's like the most trustworthy thing ever. Um, I'm willing to bet that there is a slim chance that over 30% of Windows torrents may contain high priority security vulnerabilities, such as you're getting your ISOs from torrents. Um, if anyone's used Vagrant, like this is how you, does that fit? It eh, fits enough. This is how you decide which Vagrant image to use. A shortened URL? Like what am I meant to infer about how trustworthy that is? Like if, if people, if there aren't people who have a weekend project of Trojaning vagrant images to own developers in large agile organizations, do I have a project for you? Um, Cause like, that just seems easy. Like here, trust this random URL that goes to an S3 bucket, which you have no ability to work out whether it's trustworthy or not. And people will trust it. Uh, especially if you tell them it provides all the things you want. Uh, exploiting humans, blah, blah, blah. But this just seems like, a bad idea, worse than trusting curl. So is Docker itself secure? Because that's kind of the thing people care about. Uh, and if you've ever heard of a company called FireEye, this slide might be appropriate. Um, so if you don't run things as root in Docker, then it, the story kind of gets better. Uh, and there's a bunch of other things you can do, like don't use privilege mode, which is kind of clueful in the name. You can drop capabilities so it can mount um, file systems, it can't do certain types of network calls. You can use Docker Notary, which is a fancy way of making curl pipe to SH not as sketchy, and it's backed by some actually solid, solidly researched crypto. Um, and they often say you should use things like GR security and SE Linux, which you should, but no one is, let's be honest. Like, how many attackers have gone, oh, this is running GR security, I better, like, really dig down. No, no, one, no one's doing that. And SE Linux is, the tool for making you disable SE Linux upon boot. Um, but like, going back to the original question, is Docker secure? And more secure than what? Um, and to an extent from whom? Which is like basic threat modeling, um, which no one appears to be doing anymore, which is kind of like, it must be secure. And you're like, you haven't given me any parameters. Um, if my attacker has a billion dollars of budget, we lose. Basic facts. Um, so there's, yeah, I just said that. Brilliant slide advancing ban. Um, I would argue that lateral movement is kind of more important than UID equals zero. And it seems that there's a degree, um, a degree of focus on getting root on things. And I think that comes out of how cool we all were in the 90s. Um, but as an attacker, if I can get your credit card information with UID equals eight, I don't care. I've got your credit card information. Um, and like, given the choice of getting root on a thing that's in a useless place on your network or having just lateral access from a very central place in your network, I will go for non-root every time and be able to get to more things. With Because um, like, privilege doesn't matter so much in the very thousands of machine, distributed machines model that we've moved into. Um, when there was just one machine and that contained like mail, web, database, um, your ancient copy of Mailman sending you passwords every month, um, then like getting root on that box was actually useful, but now it's like 400 web servers, 200 database servers. Root on an individual machine is no longer quite the prize it was. And I think for Docker this makes a ton of sense because if I have credentials on a Docker thing, container, I would far rather have that than have root on a server that has nothing. Um, and the fact whether it's running in a container or it's running on like $80,000 worth of IBM hardware, to an attacker, I don't care what it's running on. I just care what I can do with it and what access I can get with it. So I'm not saying Docker is unhackable because it's not, 
it's just some C groups and some name spacing, which is really cool stuff, uh, but it's not as hardened as a hypervisor. It's just a, you shouldn't talk to this rather than a set of an, uh, abstractions out. Um, escapes will probably happen. Um, they'll probably have names and logos, and we'll all probably drink a lot about it. But it, I don't think that matters as much unless you have to manage it. Uh, but they have at least a useful security team who are open to doing things about it. But I think it can be used in a way that's secure enough. Uh, but it doesn't mean you should just in, in, install it everywhere just because it's new and shiny and you think it's cool. And like stuff like network separation is still as important as it ever was. Um, and I don't think I think people are mostly using it on very flat networks and cloud networks rather than trying to block uh, lock down access to certain things. Um, and there's this stuff called unikernels, which compiles your application into a kernel, and then there's no user land, and it's all magical uh, San Francisco stuff. No one cares. <laughs> a good thing you can use with Docker is everyone's favorite thing, Jenkins. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've not heard of Jenkins, it's a build pipeline tool. Uh, basically, if you have developers, which you probably do, um, they put their code in it, it runs tests, both the tests the developers have written, um, and then spits out at, at the end going, it worked, it didn't work, go and deploy it, blah, blah, blah. Um, the great thing about Jenkins is its entire job is to take random code, seemingly arbitrary code, and run it with access to like secrets and credentials and keys and things like this. Like, this is Jenkins' job. Um, it's just remote code as a service, uh, which seems a little bold. I, I know a number of people on the offensive side who are like, they've got Jenkins, we've won. There is, it's, oh. And because it's all uh, XML-based configs, it's very easy for it to get very crufty, and it still contains all your codes and secrets. But that's not all. They've helpfully made it so you can just be like, I can just randomly put code in to execute via the web that will run every time. This seems a bold thing. Uh, and it gets worse. This is whole script console. Well, I don't know if you can see that. That's like the UID of Jenkins. It's running ID and just not putting it there. It's like a shell in a web page. Who, who thought this was a good idea? Um, clearly, someone. Um, but the, if you do run Jenkins in your infrastructure, then disabling execution on the master, which is basically I can, build, I can make a job on it, give me a shell on it, which just seems a terrible idea. Uh, it has a not the best authentication model, but it's better than anonymous access, which is give me a web shell. Um, and if you can use Travis and make it somebody else's problem, that's a really nice idea. Just pay someone some money and it becomes their problem. But what if Jenkins could be used for good things? Um, and Nick talked about this earlier in his life, not even today. 2012, maybe even, maybe even in Austin. You've talked about this in Austin. Um, yeah, local hero. Um, and this is like using a bunch of um, unit tests in your code to make um, actual security decisions about your code as they're being pushed through. Um, the Gauntlet project done by uh, Matt Ye and uh, Wicket um, about being mean to your code is using Jenkins to actually test how good your code is. Uh, there's a whole secure pipeline um, GitHub project, and even Adobe have a blog on doing secure pipeline stuff. The only part in Adobe where security is mentioned <laughs> is a blog post on doing this. You're like, can you just go and talk to the rest of your organization? <laughs> Please, I, like, w that would be rad. Um, but the, the idea is you can turn your Jenkins from being this, um, which works better on 16 by nine, uh, to this. Um, <laughs> I just wanted that references. Finally, we're at the summary. You can all go and drink a beer. Um, so computers are hard. I still think that the typing stuff and the coding stuff, sorry Nick, is actually the easy bit and the trusting people uh, and working out how to human is actually hard. And I think as an industry, we focus very much on the typey typey and the mad zero day and the uh, like shell code and we don't focus on the how we work out trust relationships and um, how we, like computer as grown ups with each other. Um, like, OAuth is awful, and it's complex, and that's why there are so many bugs in it, and that's why Google and Facebook find it so expensive in their bug bounty program. Um, if you have 
If you look in S3, your S3 buckets or your GitHub or even public gists or pastebin, you will probably find stuff of your company. Um, probably stuff you don't want there. Uh, really go and check your S3 buckets. I don't know anyone who's ever got S3 buckets uh, permissions on them right because they're normally like a developer goes, we want AWS. So the developer sets it up and then six months later someone from security goes, that's wide open. I wish we had had a proper conversation about it. Um, I beg you, Pete Cheslock, to stop trusting curl. Audit D is awful, and Threat Stack are never releasing their code. Um, Jenkins is awful, but it can be made better. We all have to deal with Jenkins, but you know, alcohol exists. Um, Docker and security can be used in the same sentence. Uh, Apple have a really good threat modeling guide. And it's in their IaaS development uh, part of their website. It has nothing to do with IaaS. It's all just uh, how to actually do reasonably good threat modeling. Uh, and don't be a fire eye. I should have put a full stop there, not a comma. Stop running things as root. Cool. Thank you very much.